Hello. <clears throat> well, dear minister, uh, Secretary of State, Governor, authorities, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. In fact, even uh, it's not the first time that we uh, even I can meet some of your authorities present. So, and also some of the practitioners here who are all friends of cross-border cooperation. So for me, it's a pleasure to address you. I would have hours to talk about this because this is actually my life and probably the life of most of you. But uh, maybe it's better if I concentrate on a few issues to give you an overview of what the <clears throat> association is doing, what is our current worriness, and uh, you will also listen at the end of my presentation some of the elements that have been also um, explained right now by the representative of, of the Commission. In fact, we are fully aligned right now in this moment with the uh, Commission, particularly with the Eurigio, because in the defense of uh, cross-border cooperation as minimum as, uh, as uh, it has been up to now. Because we are really, we are really worried that the discussions that can take place uh, uh, during this, the, the rest of this year regarding the distribution of funds could affect um, a parcel, a, a piece of European uh, policies which has been extremely important for the development of the integration process. There are many initiatives with much more money or in, in the European programs that it's hard to understand how are they affecting really uh, real integration. I mean, the integration at the level of the citizens. But cross-border cooperation, I think that we could agree that especially when they are coming to the people-to-people -people projects, um, this, they are activating a relationship across the borders that is guaranteeing the, the, the life of the integra European integration process for, for the future. And we think that this should not, be, should not have a, a way back. But now everything is into brackets and with a big question mark. So what to do? Well, to defend these processes, to show wherever we are uh, the richness, the wealth of these, of these uh, processes of cross-border cooperation, and to rely on the good sense of our leaders when they meet in the Council in November, to not to put too much money out of this box. Well, I'd like to begin with my presentations with uh, this image you can see here. This is uh, because it illustrates very well <clears throat> some of the elements of cross-border cooperation. This is uh, exactly at the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and it is called uh, United on the Divide. You can imagine what it means for Irish people, because this uh, was just 20 years ago, the, the, the story of the relationship across that border was uh, quite different than it is right now. But now, if you go there, you will see that there is a strong cooperation across the border. So we, even with the situation that is faced by Ireland, uh, the most developing area now of the whole islands is exactly this area which is surrounding the border. So this could uh, illustrate very well what is the feeling of Irish people when they are doing cross-border cooperation. And it's also interesting or probably uh, coincides very much with what most of you are thinking about what cross-border cooperation should be. Okay, then, uh, well, this is a thought by a famous writer, German, from before the two big wars and all the things of the 20th century. He already was asking that we should think of borders as a place not where we are arriving to the end, but where we have to still to grow. And this is very much in line with the idea of cross-border co cooperation within the European project. Well, the cross-border cooperation, as we understand it right now, it's running since the 50s. It's going in parallel with the process of European construction. But, uh, well, there were other type of, of relationship across the border in Europe. We are specialists of having a very particular uh, relationship across our borders, which is based upon the conflict. This has been the case in the last th thousand of years. But since the 50s, uh, Cross-border cooperation was developed particularly by the mayors, by the local authorities. But, uh, uh, there is a great example at the borders of Germany, the western borders of Germany, where all the mayors from the German side and the French, Dutch, Swiss, or uh, Belgium side, they said, not anymore, no more wars. And the only way to, to make something from our side is to create links across the border. Let's make business. Let's put our youngsters together. Let's try that some people from one side will marry some people in the other side. So the next generation for them will be unbelievable that it could, be, it could happen, a conflict. And then I think they made a great contribution to the European integration process, which was developed mainly 
in big summits and in, in some desk. But this, this process of integration was taking place on the ground. And it is so that uh, now the, we are considered, we, the cross-border people, we are considered laboratories for this European integration. And even this, this experience has been translated to other continents in which they are trying to make, to develop process of continental integration. And they have begun, of course, top-down with decisions taken at the highest level between the nations who are the sovereigns to make this kind of agreements, but also bottom-up, trying to put uh, integration elements at the level of the citizen and then to try to influence from there the rest of the process. When they meet in the middle, maybe we will find, depending on where it, the, this point is, uh, maybe we will see what we can evaluate, what is the, really the impact of these integration processes. Um, well, the, there is already, we can say, it's a long European tradition from the very 20 border regions being active in Scandinavia, Northwest Europe, and the Rhine Basin in the 60s, to around 200 structures being very active in cross-border cooperation. As the Commission has said, there are thousands of projects. I think that the all territorial cooperation projects interact, made a, a, a database, and it's, we are talking about more than 15,000 projects. And most of them are cross-border, or they have a cross-border element. So, and there are many types. We have Euro regions, working communities, cross-border cabinets. Now we have EGTCs. And the next point is macro regions that fortunately is not going to be a new type of structure, but just a strategy in which many of the cross-border cooperation programs can be coordinated somehow. In our case, the EBR, we have been running parallel to this process. In 1971, we were created by some crazy guys at the German uh, western border, trying to organize a conference of border regions to promote what it could be in the future, a cross-border cooperation program of the EU. At that time, they say these guys are crazy. But now, look, we have Interreg. Uh, our, our fathers, our founders, were very much involved in the definition of these early Interregs in the uh, 80s. Now, we have around 100 members all over Europe, but we try to represent the interests of all cross-border areas, even if they are not members, by having permanent contacts with the Commission, particularly DG Regio, with the European Parliament, but also with national governments and, of course, with the practitioners on the ground who are those who are providing to us the most important information, which is this information coming from the practice is the food that we use uh, to develop our lobby activities. Here you have a map. With the, we make one map of these maps every four years in order to update the cross-border cooperation structures because even this map was finished uh, in January 2012 and it's already outdated. There are already more structures. Then, of course, you cannot go into detail, but we have this available in our website and also we have some copies. But just to, for you to see the, the richness of cross-border cooperation movement in Europe, uh, the colors mean the red and green means if they are members or not of the EBR, and the yellow and orange means big, great cooperation structures. The frames are the EGTCs, and uh, of course there are already two EGTCs missing because they were created in the last months. But uh, you can you can identify very well uh, where the uh, the national boundaries are because they are completely full of cross-border cooperation structures. And this is a very healthy movement, and I think these are very good news and a very good argument for the member states when they have to decide if they have to take some money out of this 11.7 billion which are proposed by the Commission and reinforced by the Parliament. And if they need money for other purposes, maybe they can look in another boxes and to leave this a little bit as it is. I have made a detail of the map in this area for you to see also that, uh, of course, even in external borders of the European Union, there is uh, extraordinary development of cross-border cooperation structures. And this has not only to do with the uh, availability of European funding, because even in other parts of Europe, uh, of the continent, where there are no European funds or this type of funds available, also cross-border cooperation structures are uh, created. For instance, here, you can see at the border between Ukraine and Russia is full of cross-border cooperation structures and they are not eligible for European territorial cooperation. But they have understood very well that the, this process and this model of cross-border cooperation is a suitable one. Well, uh, uh, this is an example of uh, what's happening also in other continents. They are following the model. Even they don't have funding, uh, but they are trying to develop somehow a 
Continental Fund for Cross-Border Cooperation. But all these areas which are, are uh, marked, they are uh, uh, developing cross-border cooperation programs. And these, rom sorry, and these rhomboids I have made here, they are uh, the, the development areas in which cross-border cooperation is, is, is playing a crucial role. We are following this very uh, carefully with the assistance of the European Commission in order to try to, to, well, to assist these processes and also to learn because they are going in sometimes faster than we did here in Europe. The same, very much complicated, is the case of Africa in which uh, all the green are cross-border cooperation processes. Some of them, they are being developed even during centuries because they have to do with all African cultures that were cut by the, the, uh, the border division made by European powers at the end of the 19th century. And now, with the independence of many of these states, despite of the many difficulties they are facing, there are, we can identify very, very interesting cross-border cooperation which have to do with cultural links, with trade um, uh, paths, etc. Of course, there are conflicts, uh, there are problems related to the trafficking of, of people, weapons and drugs. Uh, there are also this uh, 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 movement of, uh, related to the terrorism, which is uh, alterating very much these processes. But the processes are going on and we are trying to support somehow as, uh, some of them. Well, this slide is only to show you about, well, we, what is the framework that we use for cross-border cooperation? Well, in many cases, we have bilateral, trilateral, or multilateral agreements. You can see the Karlsruhe Agreement, the Nordic Agreement, many others. But there was no single European framework within public law for cross-border cooperation. Now we have the regulations for the different programs. We have the, the general regula framework regulation for European territorial cooperation. And even we have the EGTC, the European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation, which is the only instrument within public law that is applicable in all Europe. Still, it needs to be fine-tuned, particularly in cases related to the staff and also to the participation of the countries in the external borders of the EU. But there is a proposal also by the Commission to make a, a modification of this regulation, and I think that the next period we will have an instrument which is much more suitable for the development of cross-border cooperation. In any case, this is one more instrument. The, if you have a good euro region which is working okay and uh, it's uh, producing good uh, benefits, you don't need to make an EGTC. It's not obligatory. You will not get extra funding by creating an EGTC. But it's, it's an, a, a, another possibility within public law that uh, in some cases is very suitable. Well, um, some of the arguments we use is that um, the supranational integration process, as the European Union is, will not guarantee the development of all territories. If we leave it like that, it will guarantee the development of the developed territories. And those territories which are uh, under big challenges, they will, they will be left behind. So uh, there could be a kind of territorial dumping. That's why, okay, that's why we are asking for some positive discrimination of, of uh, uh, European border areas. I have been asked to be very, very brief, so maybe I will jump to our position on the new regulation. In any case, well, here there are some things that you know maybe much better than me, and the, the presentation will be, of course, available for you, and I will be available for you if you need some uh, explanations. Then let me go, well, these are the, this, the, we have a set of arguments that we always present, particularly to the member states, because not all member states are in favor of, of course, border cooperation as could be the case of countries which are more small and the effects of the border are felt in the whole country. In some places, we have to make a strong effort. So we have here a battery of, of uh, arguments in this sense. Even we have produced a publication on the added value of cross-border cooperation related to the different steps. And we illustrate this with projects which have been successful, which is very useful to develop new projects at the end. Well, this is where I would like to finish my presentation with this. Regarding the proposal of, and the discussions on the next regulation, we have made the, this ampel, which is a, a, the traffic light in, in German. And then what we completely agree is that there is one regulation, own regulation for European territorial cooperation, and not just a chapter on ERDF. The emphasis on quality and not only financial issues. That the allocated funds are a little bit higher, hopefully. And of course, uh, the simplification of procedures, the, the flexibility of the procedures, and also that the lump sums and flat rates, which will facilitate and make our life easier. Uh, so we have to watch out that the size of programs, when they are very high, they can damage a little bit 
the bottom-up approach. This is something we have to handle with care and to, to have to negotiate very well with our member states in order to have good programs that are respecting both. The multi-level governance of programs are to be guaranteed, guaranteed in the decision-making process. It's very important, the participation of the local and the regional level. Um, focusing only on the EU 2020 could be a little bit too strict when we are dealing with the small projects, people to people, tourism, etc. And then the question of macro regions that sometimes they are mixing up the three branches of territorial cooperation, we have to pay attention to that. And of course, what we are completely against is that uh, if finally the, the, this, the, the, pro, the projects are, or the programs are very, very, very big, uh, then the cross-border approach could be lost. This is always a risk and we have to pay very much attention. So we have to have a good combination between big projects and small projects. This is very important. What we are still missing is that the funds are not allocated per program, but still for member states. So this mm, makes difficult in some cases the real the cross-border uh, uh, element in these programs. But this is very difficult because still the logic of, of, of all these programs, including territorial cooperation, is a logic based on national uh, states. We still need to grow in this direction. And this has to be done only with a, a strong uh, collaboration and conversation between the, the different levels, the national, the regional, and the local. What we call multi-level governance that up to now is just on paper and a little bit on, on reality. We are completely uh, defending this towards the Commission. We are defending this towards the European Parliament. Uh, we are discussing with some of the member states. We have some good friends supporting. We have some others that uh, we have still. But I think that, uh, of course, the, these next three, four months are crucial. And by the end of the year, we will really know what's going to happen with us our program as, and our projects. I hope that we can meet in one or two years here saying, OK, we <laughs> then uh, this, this proof has, has been overcome. I thank you very much for your attention and your patience. Thank you. <laughs>